Good evening and welcome once again to another program of Issues in the News, where we discuss the important events that will have taken place in Guyana over the past week or so. And as is the norm, we have a plethora of important issues that we will discuss tonight. I want to welcome all of our viewers who are joining us on television in Region 5 or from Region 5. Welcome to another program of Issues in the News. To those of you who are joining us from Region 6 on television, on the east bank of the Burbis River, from, and then along Kanji and all the way along the Quarantine Coast, welcome to another program of Issues in the News. To those of you who are joining us on Freedom Radio, from Rob Street, Georgetown, welcome to another program of Issues in the News. And last but not least, to the thousands of you who are joining us on Facebook Live, across the length and breadth of Guyana, across the Caribbean, North America, Europe, and further afield, welcome to another program of Issues in the News. There are so many important issues that we have to discuss tonight. I don't know which one to start with. But before I start, as I would normally do, please share this program so that your friends and your followers can join us in tonight's discussion and we can have the widest possible audience. So press that share button on your phone, press that share button on your computer, press that share button on your iPad or tablet so that we can have the widest possible audience. And lastly, before I begin the program, I want to encourage you also to put in the comments column suggestions, questions, issues that you may wish me to address in the course of this program. I see Ganga Prasad, Ramnarain Muni, Jasmine Baldeo, Chetram Ramcharita, Rajendra Rajkumar, Pam Singh, Parish, Parishuram Mahabir, Arjun Jawahir, and so many of you. Welcome, Delon Fraser, K. Watson, Sanita Lal. And so many of you, welcome, welcome, welcome. So yesterday, I attended with Minister Devdat Indar the ceremonial signing of contracts for the construction of 222 roads along the east coast of the Marara, beginning from industry, stretching all the way to Cane Grove. As I said, at that ceremony, this which we witnessed on the east coast of the Marara yesterday is taking place right across the length and breadth of our country as we continue the infrastructural transformation of our country. A manifesto promise which we made to the electorate and which we are delivering on. Today, another 100 such contracts were signed in relation to the East Bank corridor to commission construction and or rehabilitation of 100 community roads on the east bank of the Amarara. And as I have been saying, this is taking place in every administrative region in our country. Our promise is to fix every single community road to fix every single street across the length and breadth of our country. All we are asking is that patience be exercised, understanding 
be displayed. Why? Because all the roads cannot be fixed at the same time. It takes time. We have limited number of contractors. We have limited capability to access resources at periodic intervals. We have limited labor. We wish, and of, of course, we have finite financing too. You don't think we would like to do all the roads at the same time and deliver that promise in one single swoop, but that is not physically possible. So it has to be done in stages, and that is what we are doing. What is particularly pleasing about these contracts is that they illustrate our stated commitment that no community will be left behind. Our stated commitment to positively impact every single community across our country in this infrastructural drive. And these contracts are demonstrating that. And there is no better way of proving a point than by hard evidence. I am making this special effort to explain this issue against the backdrop of a few who I have labeled the Kool-Aid Gang, a, a few who spend an inordinate amount of time and energy in prosecuting or attempting to prosecute a case of ethnic and racial discrimination against our government. Their allegation is that we only build roads and we only issue contracts for one set or to one set of people in this country. That is the constant harangue of this group that I'm labeling the Kool-Aid gang. So they look at statistics, they look at evidence, and they distort it. They jaundice it. They even pervert it in order that it suits their narrative of racial discrimination. You will recall that one member of the Kool-Aid gang did a purported analysis of roads being done in Region 5. And he randomly, according to him, selected five roads. And then so he selected five roads out of hundreds to show five communities, sorry, in which roads were being done. You have about 50 communities in Region 5 that roads are being done, but he selects five to show that in the five that he selected, more roads are being done in Indo-Guyanese communities than those being done in Afro-Guyanese communities. That is the cheap, jaundiced narrative 
that they peddle all day, all night, in the social media in particular, and elsewhere. And that is why we as a government have decided not to say, stay silent on this issue, but to confront these racial narratives propagated by these racist, racists with facts. We don't normally, as we have said over and over again, compile data or store information through an ethnic lens. But perhaps we will have to start to do so. But I have looked at the roads on the east coast of Demerara. And roads have been done in every single NDC. Beginning from Pleasance Industry. Pleasance Industry all the way to Strathaven Cane Grove. And in every, in every of those in NDCs on the East Coast, you have roads. Good for walking, four roads. Ogle, one. Sparring Dam, two. And I have the amount for each one. Better Hope, LBI NDC. Better Hope, three. LBI, six. Vrizlas, four. Triumph, BV NDC. Better for walking, three. Laura Souvenir, one. Montrose, one. Triumph, one. Then Ansgrove, the Grove Haslington NDC, Ansgrove 11, Clonbrook 5, Cove and John 9, Dutch 4 1, Golden Grove 3, Newton's L3. Then you have Bachelor's Adventure 4, Beirut 3, Buxton 18, Dazzle Scheme 18, Fowls 2, and it continues. Every single community is touched. Where is the discrimination? Yesterday in my presentation, I said Boxton had 23. Annandale got one. And I pointed out that one has to look at the thing not by segments, but holistically. Because this exercise is a cyclical one. We started this process when we got into government in 2020. So while Annandale may have gotten one in this set, Annandale had before. We have completed all in Melanie. We are still doing some in Enterprise. We did some in and more, and in hope. Now we are moving to Golden Grove and Bachelor's Adventure and Dazzle Scheme. And, 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 and the narrative continues. And the figures are here to show the cost of each of these roads. Unless we put this narrative out there, the jaundiced prejudiced, racially infected diatribe being peddled by the Kool-Aid gang will prevail. And we can't allow that to happen in our country. As I said, those racists are a dying breed. And the quicker we confront them with the facts that is or that are irrefutable, the quicker they will reach their demise. And these are the factual statistics that they cannot dispute. And in terms of who are getting the contracts, go to my Facebook page yesterday. Go to yesterday. Facebook page, yesterday of my Facebook page, and look at the photographs 
of the contractors who assembled at Luziknan, where that signing of the contracts took place. Look at the ethnic makeup of those persons. Go back to the photographs on my Facebook page, yesterday afternoon only. Just one scroll up from today. And you will see the ethnic makeup of those people who were sitting under that tent. They were the contractors largely who were there to sign their contracts. It's $7.79 billion. Look at the ethnic makeup of those contractors. So, look at the ethnic makeup of the contractors and look at the areas that will benefit from this infrastructural drive of 222 roads on the east coast of Demerara. And you will see how mischievous and divisive the Kool-Aid gang is. And that's why I'm calling them the Kool-Aid gang. And anyone who listens to them becomes part of that gang. They are mindless and they are mindless. Let me leave it there. I also have the community sports grounds that we are doing over on the East Coast. We are fencing and or refurbishing and building, upgrading and building pavilion and lavatory facilities at all these grounds on the East Coast. A total of 60 grounds, starting from Industry Pleasance, going all the way to King Grove. So let me give you quickly. Industry Pleasance, the Ogle Community Center, Ogle Playground, Sparendam Community Center, Pleasance Playground. So that's for that one NDC. Ogle Community Center, Ogle Playground, Sparendam Community Center, Pleasance Playground. One NDC only. Four grounds. Better Hope LBI NDC, Better Hope Community Center, Atlantic Garden Playground, Vrysla South Playground, Happy Acres Playground, Happy Acres Playground 2, apparently there are two playgrounds in Happy Acre, Success Playground, Pigeon Island Playground, seven playgrounds in that one NDC. BV Triumph, BV Playground, Monrepo North Playground, Block 8 Playground, Nari Playground, Monrepo Community Center Ground, Good Hope Playground, Luziknan East Playground, Luziknan Community Center, Corbin Park Playground, Allendale Eastville Playground. Buxton, Friendship Community Playground, Nonpareil Playground, Trasbay Playground, Section D, Nonpareil Playground, Collingen Housing Scheme Playground, Melanie North Playground, Melanie Playground, Block 12, Nonpareil Playground, Enterprise Community Center, Enterprise Gardens Playground, Paradise Playground. That's for the Boxton Fowls in DC. And I can continue. Every single village, 60 sports ground are going to be touched by this initiative. And that is what we mean when we say that we are transforming the entire country with no community being left behind. Haslington Grove, let me deal with that. Haslington North Playground, Haslington Playground next to the Estate Compound, Haslington New Scheme Playground, Golden Grove Community Center, Coven John Playground, Victoria Community Center, 
Hope Estate Playground, Dutch Four Playground, Hans Grove Playground, Clombrook Playground, Beehive Playground. Twelve playgrounds in that one NDC. And it continues like that. Where is the discrimination? And there are playgrounds that have already been done from 2020 to now. This is what is earmarked to be done from 2023 going forward. We have done dozens already. Boxland Community Center, we finished that and many others. Dozens of them have already been completed on the east coast of Demerara. This constitutes the remainder. Why I am doing this? Because if I don't do this, if we don't do this as a government, then they will take out Annandale Playground and say that we are only doing Annandale Playground. That is the wickedness. That is the divisive nature of people like the Black Pudding Man who has a fundamental problem with Afro-Guyanese buying black pudding from an Indian vendor at Monrepo's market. You have sick and demented people who spread these race, racial narratives every day on the social media. And unless you put these hard, irrefutable facts and statistics out there, their narrative picks up momentum because there is no answer. A false narrative can become the only narrative if the alternative is not presented, if the truth is not presented. That will be the only narrative out there on the particular issue and people are likely to accept it as the reality and the fact. And that is why it is incumbent upon us to put out what the truth is. Fortunately, fortunately, and that's why I'm saying that this is a, a dying breed, fortunately, the people in the villages who are benefiting from these contracts and these projects, infrastructural or otherwise, are living a different reality. And that is why those incendiary and in insightful entreaties, propaganda and appeals of the Kool-Aid gang are not are being ignored largely because the people in the villages and in the communities are living a different reality. That is why those who are mouthing these racist and racial diatribes are dying a slow death. Reality and facts are diminishing their potency and their existence. And this is only for the east coast of Demerara. This endeavor in relation to the grounds and sports facilities are taking place right across the length and breadth of Guyana. I have chosen to speak on the East Coast because I am a member of Parliament for the East Coast of Demerara. My colleague, the Minister of Sports, would have on many occasions listed all the facilities that we are doing across the length and breadth of Guyana. This is only a microcosm of what the government's agenda is in relation to fixing, refurbishing, and rehabilitating sports ground and, and, and sports facilities across our country. And I'm not even touching the various stadia that we are building 
in the different regions of our country. I'm not even going there. I'm dealing with just the East Coast of Demerara and just the community grounds. So I thought that I'll spend some time in putting this type of information out there, lest the narratives of the racists prevail. They can't combat, they can't contradict these facts. And I hope Public Works and the Ministry of Sports will keep disseminating these information. Because I remember one of them arguing the same one who posted the thing on, about Region 5, that the devil lies in the details. Well, go, go through the, the contracts with the sums. I don't have the time here to do it. Go, go, use it, go, to, go into the details. And do the ethnic breakdown, because that's what they do. Ethnic analysis. We don't see it like that. We see it community per community. And as I said yesterday, you determine which road to fix based upon concentration of population, use of the road, etc. Not ethnicity, not ethnicity, not racial grouping, not even political support. Because let's face it. Buxton did not vote for the PPP. Annandale did. Buxton got 23 roads. Annandale got one. You don't think we are on mind? You don't think we, we know that? I am from Annandale. You think we are discriminating against ourselves? Anyhow, let's move on. So, I read a new story in which Mayor of Georgetown, Alfred Mentor, is threatening the government with legal action for blocking an amnesty that the city council wishes to grant. I read in the news that the purported purpose of the amnesty is to facilitate the city council raising funds to pay a judgment owed to the Guyana Revenue Authority. Now, the city council is an elected body. They make decisions by vote. It's not our intention as a government to interfere with the autonomy of the city council. But the city council, like every other agency in this country, is bound by the law. The minister of local government, upon the advice of the attorney general, after learning of the intention to embark upon this amnesty, wrote to the town clerk, who is the chief executive officer of the city council under the law, and requested from the town clerk the basis and the reason for this intended amnesty and also for the town clerk to refer the minister to the particular financial regulation under which this amnesty is to be executed. Those requirements or that re those requests which were made of the town clerk are all requirements 
of the law contained in the relevant provisions of the Municipal and District Council Act by which the Georgetown Main City Council is bound. The minister was not asking for whimsical and arbitrary information. The minister was asking for the town clerk, who is the chief executive officer, to show that the legal requirements set out in the governing statute are being met or are being complied with by the Main City Council. And one would have expected that as a simple undertaking for the town clerk to embark upon. Apparently it is not. The mayor decides to respond publicly and in his tirade accused the government of wanting to bankrupt the city. Well, I don't know how, how that conclusion was arrived at. Every agency of state and of government and every individual in the country must comply, must comply with the laws of the land. The city council is not above the law. In fact, the city council has their own governing statute. And that's the statute to which I made reference. Then I realized that mentor the city council mayor is a member of the kool -Aid gang. Because he then launched a most ridiculous allegation that the government wants the city council to go into bankruptcy so that persons' properties or the city property, I believe that's what he's implying, that the city council property can go up for sale or can be put up for sale so that the government friends and families can purchase those properties. It, it is the most asinine, but yet dangerous and divisive allegation, made without any basis whatsoever. And when I, heard, when I hear things like that coming from the mouth of anyone, my respect for that person is diminished significantly. So I have placed mentor in that Kool-Aid gang because that is the type of clumsy, baseless rhetoric that emanates from the Kool-Aid gang. I didn't know mentor was of such mentality. But if he wishes, he can go ahead and violate the law and grant the amnesty and then the law will have to take its course because someone will be held responsible for all the monies waived. All the monies waived. When I was there previously as Attorney General, then Mayor Hamilton Green tried a similar stunt when he sold a particular property and did not want to pay the outstanding rates and taxes for the property. He was, the property was somehow connected to him, I can't remember. But millions of dollars in tax rates and taxes were owed for that property. And he wanted it to be written off as he was selling the property. That is what these people do in office. That's what they use their position for. 
And when you try to get legal compliance, you are met with the ridiculous type of allegations made by mentor in relation to this matter. So, we are scheduled to have a special sitting of the National Assembly on the 3rd of November, which is Friday coming, to discuss the unfolding of events taking place in Venezuela in relation to its baseless claim against Guyana's sovereign territory. It's common knowledge now that Venezuela, Venezuela's government is proceeding with a referendum which in essence, among other things, seeks a mandate from the Venezuelan electorate by way of a referendum to annex over two-thirds of Guyana's sovereign territory. This is so despite a case pending between the two states at the International Court of Justice arising out of a recommendation made by the United Nations Secretary General who is empowered to make such a recommendation by a 1966 agreement signed in Geneva, called the Geneva Agreement, signed between the government of Guyana and the government of Venezuela. So empowering the UN Secretary General. So notwithstanding the pendency of this matter in the court, Venezuela wants to ignore the legal process, ignore the edict of the United Nations Secretary General, ignore the 1966 Geneva Agreement, ignore the 1899 Arbitral Award, ignore international law, ignore statements of condemnation coming from the UN Secretary General himself and more recently from CARICOM, from OAS, Organization of American State and the US government among others. Ignoring all of that, Venezuela seemed to be bent on proceeding. in this fashion. Fortunately, the government and the opposition are united on this issue and the leader of the opposition and His Excellency the President have met. Discussions were had and it was agreed that we'll have a special sitting of the National Assembly. Just before the commencement of this program, an unfortunate situation is unfolding, where now I understand that the chief whip of the opposition is complaining that there is no discussion in relation to the sitting. Well, when the decision to have the sitting was made, I was in Angola with the speaker and the clerk, and I got the distinct impression that the sitting is fixed for the third. I got a notification to that effect. And from what I learned from my colleagues in government, it's a, it's, it's a gone conclusion. Now we are learning that there must be some prior meeting, I suppose that meeting will take place before the sitting 
and we will proceed with the sitting so that we can speak from our parliament or our national assembly with one voice on this Venezuela issue. In addition, you would have seen a public statement by our government in which the government has indicated that an approach has been made to the ICJ for certain interim measures. Most of you will know that, well, first of all, let me backpedal a little. What you have here is that the matter is in the court and one party who has voluntarily or involuntarily submitted to the jurisdiction of the court and is participating in the proceedings in the court has decided outside of the court to take steps that clearly are inimical and inconsistent with the integrity of the legal proceedings themselves and can be considered not only disrespectful of the court's process, but can be interpreted as attempts to defeat the court's purpose and defeat the litigation itself. In those circumstances, a party must have a right to approach a court faced with such a situation to ask that court for some type of reliefs that will preserve the integrity of the legal process pending before it. And in such a situation, a court has a duty to take such measures and issue such orders to protect its process or processes from abuse. No court will stand idly by or ought to stand idly by while the subject matter of the litigation that is engaging the attention of the court is being destroyed by a process outside of the court. So those are the issues that are currently before the court. And the court, I suppose, will treat with the matter as such, as it deems fit. I don't want to say so, too much, just to explain how the approach of the, why the approach of the court was made and the circumstances in relation to how a court should approach or how a court would approach such a situation. But we leave that for the court and we are going to be in Parliament and hopefully we will speak resolutely with one voice on this matter as parliamentarians on Friday. Whatever impasse seem to be developing, I hope it would be overcome very swiftly. So I'm looking at your, um, your comments to see whether I can reply to any. Um, anyway, a lot of <laughs> People carry on their own discussions there, but that's good. So the African Export Import Bank is here in Guyana and has pledged to finance infrastructural and other projects in Guyana. Again, this is another demonstration of the confidence that Ex important external 
international bodies and financial institutions are demonstrating in Guyana's economy. African Exim Bank would not have been here if they did not see Guyana as an important developmental investment partner. No bank will want to lend money to a person, company, or entity that is not financially, economically, and otherwise viable. Banks exist to make a profit. We have China Exim Bank here doing business with Guyana. We have India Exim Bank doing business with Guyana. We have the US Exim Bank doing business with Guyana. I don't know which other, but now you have the African Exim Bank doing business with Guyana. And we must appreciate the reality of these expression of interests and use them to debunk the doomsayers who every day wants to paint a dismal picture despite the transformation that is taking place before their eyes and despite the fact that their lives are being transformed, their own communities are being transformed, but they will not accept that because to accept that means that they will have to pay a compliment to the PPP and our government. And that is an allergy to them. They can't do it. The election fraud cases, as you would have observed in the press, is gaining some momentum. The special, well, the Director of Public Prosecutions, I know, have written to the Chancellor of the Judiciary requesting that a magistrate be assigned to deal with the matters. I believe that letter is still with the Chancellor. Hopefully, a response will be made to it. I read in the newspapers that one magistrate is moving forward and has requested the prosecution to do certain things. Hopefully, the directives of the learned magistrate will be complied with by the prosecutor and we can eventually have some movement in this matter. I have spoken a lot about it. I, people are commenting a lot about it. And finally, after three years, we seem to be getting some movement forward. So, uh, but that didn't come easy. But better late than never. So let us see how these, the, these events are unfolding. Um, the Madhya CUI is now concluding its process. I understand from the press that a month's extension has been granted by His Excellency the President, and the Commission has closed the taking of evidence. So that's one phase of the Commission has concluded and the month, I suppose, will be used to do other matters that the commissioner, Commission thinks fit. Be reminded that the Commission of Inquiry is a, a body that regulates itself in accordance with the Commission of Inquiry's Act. I see in the one segment of the press, this, what appears to be an unusual pursuit towards Minister of Education Priya Manik Chand. 
and I am trying to, I've been following it, and I am trying to understand this pursuit. The chief education officer testified before this commission and answered all the questions that were asked of him, and I believe I read excerpts of his evidence in the press, and I believe he acquitted himself with distinction. I don't know what other question. could have been posed to Minister Manichan, and I don't know what other question, what other answer, sorry, Minister Manichan would have provided, different or addition to what the Chief Education Officer presented in his testimony. And that's why I am bewildered by the relentless pursuit of this segment of the press. They, they are after this famous UNESCO report and the chief education officer spoke at length about the fact that it is our government that requested that report that the report was reviewed, that it was only received in the year 2022. It's a very big report. It has to be reviewed. The technical people have to determine whether they will accept all the recommendations or some of the recommendations. Once that process is completed, then one has to budget to implement the recommendations. And all of that evidence was given by the chief executive or chief education officer. And yet, I see this relentless pursuit in this one direction. It seemed to convey the impression that there is some other motive at play. I am not seeing anywhere in publications by that section of the media of important facts in relation to the Madhya dorm. And I don't want to defend anything here, I'm not. For example, that the children were put in that dorm under the previous administration that they did two inquiries, some COI and another audit of these facilities, and they didn't see anything wrong with it. But I'm not seeing those things coming out in the press in the same way that this, this, this pursuit in this one direction is being executed. Fair reporting requires reportage of all the facts, and those are material facts in my view. But I don't want to prejudge or prejudice the commission, so I'm not going to say anything more, but I thought that I will, I will voice those views because it did strike me as strange, the manner in which this particular segment of the press is viewing this commission. The commission is independent and the commission will make its, its, its recommendations. It seems as though this press outfit w w would like a particular outcome and is disappointed apparently that this outcome that, is a, that it expects is not being unfolded. So I sense deep regret and even anger 
in some of the writings published in this section of the press, which is quite unfortunate. I don't know on an important issue like that. One would want to prejudge the outcome of an inquiry. One can criticize it, but this particular instance here presents, in my respectful view, alarming evidence of an intention to secure a particular outcome from the Commission of Inquiry. And an expression of great disappointment that this particular outcome is not forthcoming. That's the impression I get. And I am entitled to my impression as well. And I'm entitled to express my view on what I'm reading. And it doesn't augur well for journalism. Anyway, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, my operator has signaled to, has signaled to me that we have approached program time. I want to thank you very much for the past hour you have spent with me. I didn't get to deal with all the issues, but we'll continue this discourse next week. I thank you, and please enjoy the rest of the week. Stay healthy, stay strong, and I'll see you again next Tuesday as we continue our discourse on issues in the news. Thank you, and good evening.